Chapter 33 The Fate of Injun Joe Within a few minutes the news had spread, and a dozen skiff-loads of men were on their way to MacDougall's cave, and the ferry-boat, well filled with passengers, soon followed. Tom Sawyer was in a skiff that bore Judge Thatcher. When the cave-door was unlocked, a sorrowful sight presented itself in the dim twilight of the place. Injun Joe lay stretched upon the ground, dead, with his face close to the crack of the door, as if his longing eyes had been fixed to the latest moment upon the light and the cheer of the free world outside. Tom was touched, for he knew by his own experience how this wretch had suffered. His pity was moved, but nevertheless he felt an abounding sense of relief and security now, which revealed to him in a degree which he had not fully appreciated before how vast a weight of dread had been lying upon him since the day he lifted his voice against this bloody-minded outcast. Injun Joe's bowie-knife lay close by, its blade broken in two. The great foundation beam of the door had been chipped and hacked through with tedious labor. Useless labor, too, it was, for the native rock formed a sill outside it, and upon that stubborn material the knife had wrought no effect. The only damage done was to the knife itself. But if there had been no stony obstruction there, the labor would have been useless still. For if the beam had been wholly cut away, Injun Joe could not have squeezed his body under the door. And he knew it. So he had only hacked that place in order to be doing something, in order to pass the weary time, in order to employ his tortured faculties. Ordinarily one could find half a dozen bits of candle stuck around in the crevices of this vestibule, left there by tourists, but there were none now. The prisoner had searched them out and eaten them. He had also contrived to catch a few bats, and these also he had eaten, leaving only their claws. The poor unfortunate had starved to death. In one place near at hand a stalactite had been slowly growing up from the ground for ages, builded by the water-drip from a stalactite overhead. The captive had broken off the stalagmite, and upon the stump had placed a stone, wherein he had scooped a shallow hollow to catch the precious drop that fell once in every three minutes, with the dreary regularity of a clock-tick, a dessert-spoonful once in four-and-twenty hours. That drop was falling when the pyramids were new, when Troy fell, when the foundations of Rome were laid, when Christ was crucified, when the conqueror created the British Empire when Columbus sailed, when the massacre at Lexington was news. It is falling now, it will still be falling, when all these things shall have sunk down the afternoon of history and the twilight of tradition, and been swallowed up in the thick night of oblivion. Has everything a purpose and a mission? Did this drop fall patiently during five thousand years to be ready for this flitting human insect's need? And has it another important object to accomplish ten thousand years to come? No matter. It is many and many a year since the hapless half-breed scooped out the stone to catch the priceless drops, but to this day the tourist stares longest at that pathetic stone and that slow-dropping water when he comes to see the wonders of MacDougall's cave. Injun Joe's cup stands first in the list of the cavern's marvels. Even Aladdin's palace cannot rival it. Injun Joe was buried near the mouth of the cave, and people flocked there in boats and wagons from the towns and from all the farms and hamlets for seven miles around. They brought their children and all sorts of provisions, and confessed that they had had almost as satisfactory a time at the funeral as they could have had at the hanging. This funeral stopped the further growth of one thing, the petition to the governor for Injun Joe's pardon. The petition had been largely signed, many tearful and eloquent meetings had been held, and a committee of sappy women been appointed to go in deep mourning and wail around the governor, and implore him to be a merciful ass and trample his duty underfoot. Injun Joe was believed to have killed five citizens of the village, but what of that? If he had been Satan himself there would have been plenty of weaklings ready to scribble their names to a pardon petition, and drip a tear on it from their permanently impaired and leaky waterworks. The morning after the funeral Tom took Huck to a private place to have an important talk. Huck had learned all about Tom's adventure from the Welshman and the widow Douglas by this time, but Tom said he reckoned there was one thing they had not told him. That thing was what he wanted to talk about now. Huck's face saddened. He said, "'I know what it is. You got into number two and never found anything but whiskey. 
Nobody told me it was you, but I just knowed it must have been you, soon as I heard about that whiskey business. And I knowed you hadn't got the money, because you'd have got it me some way or other, and told me even if you was mum to everybody else. Tom, something's always told me we'd never get hold of that swag. Why, Huck, I never told on that tavern keeper. You know his tavern was all right the Saturday I went to the picnic. Don't you remember you was to watch there that night? Oh, yes. Why, it seems about a year ago. It was that very night that I followed Injun Joe to the Widder's. You followed him? Yes, but you keep mum. I reckon Injun Joe's left friends behind him, and I don't want them soaring on me and doing me mean tricks. If it hadn't been for me, he'd be down in Texas now, all right. Then Huck told his entire adventure in confidence to Tom, who had only heard of the Welshman's part of it before. Well, said Huck, presently, coming back to the main question, whoever nipped the whiskey in number two nipped the money, too, I reckon. Anyway, it's a goner for us, Tom. Huck, that money wasn't ever in number two. What? Huck searched his comrade's face keenly. Tom, have you got on the track of that money again? Huck, it's in the cave. Huck's eyes blazed. Say it again, Tom. The money's in the cave. Tom, honest Injun now, is it fun or earnest? Earnest, Huck, just as earnest as ever I was in my life. Will you go in there with me and help me get it out? I bet I will. I will if it's where we can blaze our way to it and not get lost. Huck, we can do that without the least little bit of trouble in the world. Good as wheat. What makes you think the money's— Huck, you just wait till we get in there. If we don't find it, I'll agree to give you my drum and everything I've got in the world. I will, by jings. All right, it's a whiz. When do you say? Right now, if you say it. Are you strong enough? Is it far in the cave? I've been on my pins a little three, four days now, but I can't walk more than a mile, Tom. At least I don't think I could. It's about five mile into there the way anybody but me would go, Huck. But there's a mighty short cut that they don't anybody but me know about. Huck, I'll take you right to it in a skiff. I'll float the skiff down there, and I'll pull it back again all by myself. You needn't ever turn your hand over. Let's start right off, Tom. All right. We want some bread and meat and our pipes, and a little bag or two, and two or three kite strings, and some of these new-fangled things they call lucifer matches. I tell you, many's the time I wished I had some when I was in there before. A trifle afternoon the boys borrowed a small skiff from a citizen who was absent, and got under way at once. When they were several miles below Cave Hollow, Tom said, "'Now, you see this bluff here looks all alike all the way down from the Cave Hollow? No houses, no woodyards, bushes all alike. But do you see that white place up there, where there's been a landslide? Well, that's one of my marks. We'll get ashore now.' They landed. "'Now, Huck, where we're a-standin', you could touch that hole I got out of with a fishing-pole. See if you can find it.' Huck searched all the place about and found nothing. Tom proudly marched into a thick clump of sumac bushes and said, "'Here you are. Look at it, Huck. It's the snuggest hole in this country. You just keep mum about it. All along I've been wanted to be a robber, but I knew I'd got to have a thing like this, and where to run across it was the bother. We've got it now, and we'll keep it quiet. Only we'll let Joe Harper and Ben Rogers in, because of course there's got to be a gang, or else there wouldn't be any style about it. Tom Sawyer's gang. It sounds splendid, don't it, Huck? Well, it just does, Tom. And who'll we rob? Oh, most anybody. Waylay people, that's mostly the way. And kill them? No, not always. Hive them in the cave till they raise a ransom. What's a ransom? Money. You make them raise all they can, often their friends. And after you've kept them a year, if it ain't raised, then you kill them. That's the general way. Only you don't kill the women. You shut up the women but you don't kill them. They're always beautiful and rich and awfully scared. You take their watches and things, but you always take your hat off and talk polite. They ain't anybody as polite as robbers. You'll see that in any book. Well, the women get to loving you, and after they've been in the cave a week or two weeks, they stop crying, and after that you couldn't get them to leave. If you drove them out, they'd turn right around and come back. It's so in all the books. Why, it's really bully, Tom. I believe it's better than to be a pirate. Yes, it's better in some ways, because it's close to home and circuses and all that." By this time everything was ready, and the boys entered the hole, Tom in the lead. They toiled their way to the farther end of the tunnel, then made their spliced kite-strings fast, and moved on. A few steps brought them to the spring, and Tom felt a shudder quiver all through him. He 
He showed Huck the fragment of candlewick perched on a lump of clay against the wall, and described how he and Becky had watched the flame struggle and expire. The boys began to quiet down to whispers now, for the stillness and gloom of the place oppressed their spirits. They went on, and presently entered and followed Tom's other corridors until they reached the jumping-off place. The candles revealed the fact that it was not really a precipice, but only a steep clay hill twenty or thirty feet high. Tom whispered, "'Now I'll show you something, Huck.' He held his candle aloft and said, "'Look as far round the corner as you can. Do you see that? There, on the big rock over yonder, down with the candle smoke. Tom, it's a cross. Now, where's your number two? Under the cross, hey? Right yonder's where I saw Indian Joe poke up his candle, Huck.' Huck stared at the mystic sign a while, and then said with a shaky voice, "'Tom, let's get out of here.' "'What? And leave the treasure?' "'Yes, leave it. Injun Joe's ghost is round about there, certain.' "'No, it ain't, Huck. No, it ain't. It would ha'nt the place where he died, away out at the mouth of the cave, five miles from here.' "'No, Tom, it wouldn't. It would hang around the money. I know the ways of ghosts, and so do you.' Tom began to fear that Huck was right. Misgivings gathered in his mind, but presently an idea occurred to him. "'Look here, Tuck. What fools we're making of ourselves! Injun Joe's ghost ain't a-going to come round where there's a cross.' The point was well taken. It had its effect. "'Tom, I didn't think of that. But that's so. It's luck for us, that cross is. I reckon we'll climb down there and have a hunt for that box.' Tom went first, cutting rude steps in the clay hill as he descended. Huck followed. Four avenues opened out of the small cavern which the great rock stood in. The boys examined three of them with no result. They found a small recess in the one nearest the base of the rock, with a pallet of blankets spread down in it. Also an old suspender, some bacon rind, and the well-gnawed bones of two or three fowls. But there was no money-box. The lads searched and researched this place, but in vain. Tom said, "'He said, under the cross. Well, this comes nearest to being under the cross. It can't be under the rock itself, because that's set solid on the ground.' They searched everywhere once more, and then sat down discouraged. Huck could suggest nothing. By and by Tom said, "'Looky here, Huck. There's footprints and some candle grease on the clay about one side of this rock, but not on the other sides. Now what's that for? I bet you the money is under the rock. I'm going to dig in the clay." "'That ain't no bad notion, Tom,' said Huck, with animation. Tom's real Barlow was out at once, and he had not dug four inches before he struck wood. "'Hey, Huck, you hear that?' Huck began to dig and scratch now. Some boards were soon uncovered and removed. They had concealed a natural chasm which led under the rock. Tom got into this and held his candle as far under the rock as he could, but said he could not see to the end of the rift. He proposed to explore. He stooped and passed under. The narrow way descended gradually. He followed its winding course, first to the right and then to the left. Huck at his heels. Tom turned a short curve by and by and exclaimed, "'My goodness, Huck, looky here!' It was the treasure-box, sure enough, occupying a snug little cavern, along with an empty powder-keg, a couple of guns in leather cases, two or three pairs of old moccasins, a leather belt, and some other rubbish well soaked with the water-drip. "'Got it at last!' said Huck, ploughing among the tarnished coins with his hands. "'My, but we're rich, Tom!' "'Huck, I always reckoned we'd get it. It's just too good to believe. But we have got it, sure. Say, let's not fool around here. Let's snake it out. Let me see if we can lift the box.' It weighed about fifty pounds. Tom could lift it after an awkward fashion, but could not carry it conveniently. "'I thought so,' he said. They carried it like it was heavy, that day at the haunted house. I noticed that. I reckon I was right to think of fetching the little bags along." The money was soon in the bags, and the boys took it up to the cross rock. "'Now let's fetch the guns and things,' said Huck. "'No, Huck. Leave them there. They're just the tricks to have when you go to robbing. We'll keep them there all the time, and we'll hold our orgies there, too. It's an awful snug place for orgies.' "'What's orgies?' "'I don't know. But robbers always have orgies, and of course we've got to have them, too. Come along, Huck. We've been in here a long time. It's getting late, I reckon. I'm hungry, too. We'll eat and smoke when we get to the skiff.' They presently emerged into the clump of sumac bushes, looked warily about, found the coast clear, 
and were soon lunching and smoking in the skiff. As the sun dipped toward the horizon, they pushed out and got under way. Tom skimmed up the shore through the long twilight, chatting cheerily with Huck, and landed shortly after dark. "'Now, Huck,' said Tom, "'we'll hide the money in the loft of the widder's woodshed, and I'll come up in the morning, and we'll count it and divide it, and then we'll hunt up a place out in the woods for it, where it will be safe. Just you lay quiet here and watch the stuff till I run up and hook Benny Taylor's little wagon. I won't be gone a minute." He disappeared, and presently returned with the wagon, put the two small sacks into it, threw some old rags on top of them, and started off, dragging his cargo behind him. When the boys reached the Welshman's house they stopped to rest. Just as they were about to move on, the Welshman stepped out and said, "'Hello, who's that?' "'Huck and Tom Sawyer.' "'Good. Come along with me, boys. You are keeping everybody waiting. Here, hurry up, trot ahead. I'll haul the wagon for you. Why, it's not as light as it might be. Got bricks in it? Or old metal?' "'Old metal,' said Tom. "'I judge so. The boys in this town will take more trouble and fool away more time hunting up six bits worth of old iron to sell to the foundry than they would to make twice the money at regular work. But that's human nature. Hurry along, hurry along!' The boys wanted to know what the hurry was about. "'Never mind. You'll see when we get to the widow Douglas's. Huck said with some apprehension, for he was long used to being falsely accused, "'Mr. Jones, we haven't been doing nothing.' The Welshman laughed. "'Well, I don't know, Huck, my boy. I don't know about that. Ain't you and the widow good friends?' "'Yes. Well, she's been good friends to me, anyways.' "'All right, then. What do you want to be afraid for?' This question was not entirely answered in Huck's slow mind before he found himself pushed along with Tom into Mrs. Douglas's drawing-room. Mr. Jones left the wagon near the door and followed. The place was grandly lighted, and everybody that was of any consequence in the village was there. The Thatchers were there, the Harpers, the Rogerses, Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary, the minister, the editor, and a great many more, and all dressed in their best. The widow received the boys as heartily as any one could well receive two such looking beings. They were covered with clay and candle grease. Aunt Polly blushed crimson with humiliation and frowned and shook her head at Tom. Nobody suffered half as much as the two boys did, however. Mr. Jones said, Tom wasn't at home yet, so I gave him up, but I stumbled on him and Huck right at my door, and so I just brought them along in a hurry. And you did just right, said the widow. Come with me, boys. She took them to a bedchamber and said, "'Now, wash and dress yourselves. Here are two new suits of clothes—shirts, socks, everything complete. They're Huck's. No, no thanks, Huck. Mr. Jones bought one and I the other, but they'll fit both of you. Get into them. We'll wait. Come down when you are slicked up enough.' Then she left. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 Floods of Gold Huck said, Tom, we can slope if we can find a rope. The window ain't high from the ground. Shucks, what do you want to slope for? Well, I ain't used to that kind of crowd. I can't stand it. I ain't going down there, Tom. Oh, bother, it ain't anything. I don't mind it a bit. I'll take care of you. Sid appeared. Tom, said he, Auntie has been waiting for you all the afternoon. Mary got your Sunday clothes ready, and everybody's been fretting about you. Say, ain't this grease and clay on your clothes? Now, Mr. Siddy, you just tend to your own business. What's all this blow-out about, anyway? It's one of the widow's parties that she's always having. This time it's for the Welshman and his sons, on account of that scrape they helped her out of the other night. And say, I can tell you something, if you want to know. Well, what? Why, old Mr. Jones is going to try to spring something on the people here tonight, but I overheard him tell Auntie today about it, as a secret, but I reckon it's not much of a secret now. Everybody knows, the widder too, for all she tries to let on she don't. Mr. Jones was bound Huck should be here, couldn't get along with his grand secret without Huck, you know. Secret about what, Sid? About Huck tracking the robbers to the widows. I reckon Mr. Jones was going to make a grand time over his surprise. But I bet you it will drop pretty flat." Sid chuckled in a very contented and satisfied way. "'Sid, was it you that told?' "'Oh, never mind who it was. Somebody told. That's enough. Sid, there's only one person in this town mean enough to do that, and that's you. If you'd been in Huck's place, you'd have sneaked down the hill and never told anybody on the robbers. You can't do any but mean things, and you can't bear to see anybody praise for doing good ones. 
There, no thanks, as the widow says, and Tom cuffed Sid's ears and helped him to the door with several kicks. Now go and tell Auntie if you dare, and tomorrow you'll catch it. Some minutes later the widow's guests were at the supper-table, and a dozen children were propped up at little side-tables in the same room, after the fashion of that country in that day. At the proper time Mr. Jones made his little speech, in which he thanked the widow for the honor she was doing himself and his sons, but said that there was another person whose modesty, and so forth and so on. He sprung his secret about Huck's share in the adventure in the finest dramatic manner he was master of, but the surprise it occasioned was largely counterfeit and not as clamorous and effusive as it might have been under happier circumstances. However, the widow made a pretty fair show of astonishment, and heaped so many compliments and so much gratitude upon Huck that he almost forgot the nearly intolerable discomfort of his new clothes in the entirely intolerable discomfort of being set up as a target for everybody's gaze and everybody's laudations. The widow said she meant to give Huck a home under her roof and have him educated and that when she could spare the money she would start him in business in a modest way. Tom's chance was come. He said, "'Huck don't need it. Huck's rich!' Nothing but a heavy strain upon the good manners of the company kept back the due and proper complimentary laugh at this pleasant joke, but the silence was a little awkward. Tom broke it. "'Huck's got money. Maybe you don't believe it, but he's got lots of it. Oh, you needn't smile. I reckon I can show you. You just wait a minute.' Tom ran out of doors. The company looked at each other with a perplexed interest, and inquiringly at Huck, who was tongue-tied. "'Sid, what ails Tom?' said Aunt Polly. "'He—well, there ain't ever any making of that boy out. I never—' Tom entered, struggling with the weight of his sacks, and Aunt Polly did not finish her sentence. Tom poured the mass of yellow coins upon the table and said, "'There! What did I tell you? Half of it's Huck's and half of it's mine.' The spectacle took the general breath away. All gazed. Nobody spoke for a moment. Then there was a unanimous call for an explanation. Tom said he could furnish it, and he did. The tale was long, but brimful of interest. There was scarcely an interruption from any one to break the charm of its flow. When he had finished, Mr. Jones said, "'I thought I had fixed up a little surprise for this occasion, but it don't amount to anything now. This one makes it sing mighty small, I'm willing to allow. The money was counted. The sum amounted to a little over twelve thousand dollars. It was more than any one present had ever seen at one time before, though several persons were there who were worth considerably more than that in property. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 Respectable Huck Joins the Gang the reader may rest satisfied that Tom's and Huck's windfall made a mighty stir in the poor little village of St. Petersburg. So vast a sum, all in actual cash, seemed next to incredible. It was talked about, gloated over, glorified, until the reason of many of the citizens tottered under the strain of the unhealthy excitement. Every haunted house in St. Petersburg and the neighboring villages was dissected plank by plank, and its foundations dug up and ransacked for hidden treasure and not by boys, but men, pretty grave, unromantic men, too, some of them. Wherever Tom and Huck appeared they were courted, admired, stared at. The boys were not able to remember that their remarks had possessed weight before, but now their sayings were treasured and repeated. Everything they did seemed somehow to be regarded as remarkable. They had evidently lost the power of doing and saying commonplace things. Moreover, their past history was raked up and discovered to bear marks of conspicuous originality. The village paper published biographical sketches of the boys. The widow Douglas put Huck's money out at six per cent, and Judge Thatcher did the same with Tom's at Aunt Polly's request. Each lad had an income now that was simply prodigious. A dollar for every weekday in the year and half of the Sundays. It was just what the minister got. No, it was what he was promised. He generally couldn't collect it. A dollar and a quarter a week would board, lodge, and school a boy in those old simple days, and clothe him and wash him, too, for that matter. Judge Thatcher had conceived a great opinion of Tom. He said that no commonplace boy would ever have got his daughter out of the cave. When Becky told her father, in strict confidence, how Tom had taken her whipping at school, the judge was visibly moved. And when she pleaded grace for the mighty lie which Tom had told in order to shift that whipping from her shoulders to his own, the 
judge said with a fine outburst that it was a noble, a generous, a magnanimous lie, a lie that was worthy to hold up its head and march down through history breast to breast with George Washington's lauded truth about the hatchet. Becky thought her father had never looked so tall and so superb as when he walked the floor and stamped his foot and said that. She went straight off and told Tom about it. Judge Thatcher hoped to see Tom a great lawyer or a great soldier some day. He said he meant to look to it that Tom should be admitted to the National Military Academy, and afterward trained in the best law school in the country, in order that he might be ready for either career or both. Huck Finn's wealth and the fact that he was now under the widow Douglas's protection introduced him into society—no, dragged him into it, hurled him into it, and his sufferings were almost more than he could bear. The widow's servants kept him clean and neat, combed and brushed, and they bedded him nightly in unsympathetic sheets that had not one little spot or stain which he could press to his heart and know for a friend. He had to eat with knife and fork, and had to use napkin, cup, and plate. He had to learn his book, he had to go to church, he had to talk so properly that speech was become insipid in his mouth. Whithersoever he turned, the bars and shackles of civilization shut him in and bound him hand and foot. He bravely bore his miseries three weeks, and then one day turned up missing. For forty-eight hours the widow hunted for him everywhere in great distress. The public were profoundly concerned. They searched high and low, they dragged the river for his body. Early the third morning Tom Sawyer wisely went poking among some old empty hogsheads down behind the abandoned slaughterhouse, and in one of them he found the refugee. Huck had slept there. He had just breakfasted upon some stolen odds and ends of food, and was lying off now in comfort with his pipe. He was unkempt, uncombed, and clad in the same old ruin of rags that had made him picturesque in the days when he was free and happy. Tom routed him out, told him the trouble he had been causing, and urged him to go home. Huck's face lost its tranquil content, and took a melancholy cast, and said, "'Don't talk about it, Tom. I've tried it, and it don't work. It don't work, Tom. It ain't for me. I ain't used to it. The widder's good to me and friendly, but I can't stand them ways. She makes me get up just at the same time every morning. She makes me wash. They comb me all to thunder. She won't let me sleep in the woodshed. I got to wear them blamed clothes that just smothers me, Tom. They don't seem to let any air get through em somehow and they're so rotten nice that I can't set down, nor lay down, nor roll around anywheres. I ain't slid on a cellar door for—well, it appears to be years. I got to go to church and sweat and sweat. I hate them ornery sermons. I can't catch a fly in there. I can't chaw. I got to wear shoes all Sunday. The widder eats by a bell. She goes to bed by a bell. She gets up by a bell. Everything's so awful regular a body can't stand it. Well, everybody does that, Huck. Tom, it don't make no difference. I ain't everybody, and I can't stand it. It's awful to be tied up so, and grub comes too easy. I don't take no interest in vittles that way. I got to ask to go a-fishing. I got to ask to go in a-swimming. Durned if I ain't got to ask to do everything. Well, I'd got to talk so nice it wasn't no comfort. I'd got to go up in the attic and rip out a while every day to get a taste in my mouth, or I'd a died, Tom. The widder wouldn't let me smoke. She wouldn't let me yell. She wouldn't let me gape, nor stretch, nor scratch before folks. Then, with a spasm of special irritation and injury, and dead fetch it, she prayed all the time. I never see such a woman. I had to shove, Tom. I just had to. And besides, that school's going to open, and I'd have got to go to it. Well, I wouldn't stand that, Tom. Looky here, Tom. Being rich ain't what it's cracked up to be. It's just worry and worry and sweat and sweat and a wishin' you was dead all the time. Now, these clothes suits me, and this barrel suits me, and I ain't ever going to shake em any more. Tom, I wouldn't ever got into all this trouble if it hadn't been for that money. Now, you just take my share of it along with yourn, and give me a ten-center sometimes, not many times, because I don't give a dern for a thing thout it's tolerable hard to get, and you go and beg off for me with a widder. Oh, Huck, you know I can't do that. Tain't fair. And besides, if you'll try this thing just a while longer, you'll come to like it. Like it? Yes, the way I'd like a hot stove, if I was to set on it long enough. No, Tom, I won't be rich. 
and I won't live in them cussed smothery houses. I like the woods, and the river, and hogsheads, and I'll stick to em, too. Blame it all, just, just as we've got guns in a cave, and all just fixed to rob, here this dern foolishness has got to come up and spile it all." Tom saw his opportunity. "'Looky here, Huck. Being rich ain't going to keep me back from turning robber." "'No. Oh, good licks. Are you in real deadwood earnest, Tom?' "'Just as dead earnest as I'm a-sittin' here. But, Huck, we can't let you into the gang if you ain't respectable, you know.' Huck's joy was quenched. "'Can't let me in, Tom? Didn't you let me go for a pirate?' "'Yes, but that's different. A robber is more high-toned than what a pirate is, as a general thing. In most countries they're awful high up in the nobility, dukes and such. Now, Tom, hain't you always been friendly to me? You wouldn't have shut me out, would you, Tom? You wouldn't do that, now, would you, Tom? Huck, I wouldn't want to, and I don't want to, but what would people say? Why, they'd say, humph, Tom Sawyer's gang, pretty low characters in it. They'd mean you, Huck. You wouldn't like that, and I wouldn't. Huck was silent for some time, engaged in a mental struggle. Finally he said, "'Well, I'll go back to the widder for a month and tackle it and see if I can come to stand it, if you'll let me belong to the gang, Tom.' "'All right, Huck, it's a whiz. Come along, old chap, and I'll ask the widder to let up on you a little, Huck. Will you, Tom, now, will you? That's good. If she'll let up on some of the roughest things, I'll smoke private and cuss private and crowd through or bust. When you going to start the gang and turn robbers?' Oh, right off. We'll get the boys together and have the initiation tonight, maybe. Have the which? Have the initiation. What's that? It's to swear to stand by one another and never tell the gang's secrets, even if you're chopped all to flinders, and kill anybody and all his family that hurts one of the gang. That's gay. That's mighty gay, Tom. I tell you. Well, I bet it is. And all that swearing's got to be done at midnight in the lonesomest, awfulest place you can find. A haunted house is the best, and they're all ripped up now. Well, midnight's good, anyway, Tom. Yes, so it is. And you've got to swear on a coffin and sign it with blood. Now, that's something like. Why, it's a million times bullier than pirating. I'll stick to the widder till I rot, Tom. And if I get to be regular ripper of a robber, and everybody talking about it, I reckon she'll be proud she snaked me in out of the wet. Conclusion So endeth this chronicle. It being strictly a history of a boy, it must stop here. The story could not go much further without becoming the history of a man. When one writes a novel about grown people, he knows exactly where to stop, that is, with a marriage but when he writes of juveniles, he must stop where he best can. Most of the characters that perform in this book still live, and are prosperous and happy. Some day it may seem worth while to take up the story of the younger ones again, and see what sort of men and women they turned out to be. Therefore it will be wisest not to reveal any of that part of their lives at present. THE END This is the end of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, by Mark Twain.